down a rock uh, or a stone that's taken out of the rock. But nonetheless, both are correct. So we're going to preach on the stone. The stone. In my mind, one of the most encouraging metaphors that is utilized of Almighty God in the entirety of the Word of God is that God is a rock. God is a stone. And you're going to find that especially in the Old Testament, there are many writers that when they found themselves in situations that were threatening and dangerous and impossible and they realized that they had come to the end of what they were able to do and they could not pull it off by their own strength, by their own wisdom, by their own might, by their own knowledge and therefore come Coming to the end, but realizing that God is a rock and that God is a stone, they felt and they sensed and they experienced tremendous amount of consolation and comfort and also of courage and confidence in Almighty God. Why? Because He is greater than what they are. He is the rock. Ah, hallelujah. And that's why also that in this time that you read about their experiences, that you're going to find them in times of exaltation and praise just crying out. Other times in petition and calling out upon God in a time of need. Such things as, Lord, not only are you a rock, a stone, but Lord you are my rock you're mine uh, we don't mean that as selfish but we mean that as personal intimate relationship that if out of all of the individuals in the world or that has ever lived in the world the Lord has not forgotten who I am the Lord has not forgotten where I am I am. He knows exactly. And so that's why that you will hear them cry out or express and say, the Lord is my rock and my refuge. The Lord is my rock and my salvation. The Lord is my rock and my deliverer. The Lord is my rock and everything you could go on on and on and on or maybe more individually like David when my heart is overwhelmed lead me to the rock that is higher than what I am or maybe in another place that David said I found myself in this horrible pit in this miry clay and you drag yourself up one step and you fall back to into this sinking muck and mire but he said the Lord has brought me up out of that miry clay and what did he do he set my feet upon the rock hallelujah praise God stability and even Isaiah he says that truly speaking of Jesus prophetically he is the rock in a weary land. Yes, yes. He pre presents that, that shade in the midst of this hot, burning, weary land and you think you can't take another step forward. Uh, but you see the outcropping of the rock and you find coolness and you find shade and you find rest and you find everything you have need of. So the Lord, the Lord is the rock. He's the stone.
alone. But this by, by any means is not a Old Testament metaphor. It carries on even into the New Testament and as I alluded to, that's exactly what uh, Peter is doing here, taking a lot of references from Old Testament passages and bringing them up to date and to their fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also remember the, those great words of the Lord that he spoke of himself upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And I mean, how, how good is that? How awesome is that? That God is going to build his church. That, that's not a building with pews and seats and, and sheetrock and two befores, but that's us. That's this spiritual battle uh, building. And he said that the Lord is going to build us upon the rock. Him, he is the foundation. And you know what? What can hell do about it? Not one earthly thing. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I want to look at this passage of Scripture because not only does Peter give us the fact that God, Jesus, is a rock, is a stone, but he tells us the kind of stone that he is. And that's going to be my focus here. He alludes to four different, um, you might say, not just characteristics, but workings of this stone and uh, how wonderful and how precious it is. The first thing that he tells us is that God, that Jesus is a living stone. Yes, he says. Right there in our text. He said that to whom coming as a living stone. Yes. Now Peter wants to project God, Jesus, as a stone. But he also knows that not only is stone a metaphor of God, but it's also in the Old Testament, New Testament, it's a metaphor of that which is inanimate, that which does not have life, that which has no breath, that which is dead. Now, no better place is that represented or spoken of than when Jesus in Luke chapter 19 and verse 40, it's Luke's account of Jesus and his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And that is where the Lord mounted that colt, that donkey's colt, and uh, he rode into Jerusalem. And the Bible says that the street was crowded with worshipers and they had had their palm branches waving unto him and they were crying out and praising him Hosanna Hosanna blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord Hosanna son of David and I mean they were just giving it everything that they had to praise of the Lord and, and that did not sit well with the spiritual elite and the spiritual leader and I'm not sure how they did it, but Jesus is riding in and, and they crowded in and sidled right up to him and they were aggravated, frustrated and they said, Jesus, tell your disciples basically to shut up. And Jesus said, if I were to tell them to shut up, the very, what? The rocks and stones are going to cry out. In other words, he's saying, if you're embarrassed or if you don't like this exposition of praise that is going on, then you just shut them up and you see a greater and more miraculous exhibition of praise because these rocks and stones that are dead in inanimate, no breath, no life, they will begin to cry 
cry out and praise God because you know what? God will be praised. So, so we see then that, that the stones is, is, is a metaphor of the inanimate. I'm reminded also of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 17. And you know, in his travels, he comes there to Mars Hill. And here's he's with these Greeks and, and some of these others and philosophers. And, and he sees that there are all these idols that have been built for every imaginable God that you could think of. And there was even one that had to the unknown God. Yes. They didn't want to leave any God out. Yes. And Paul, he takes the advantage of that and said, let me tell you about this unknown God. Yes, amen. But as he begins his oration and his explanation, he talks about how God is the creator of all things. How that he is the giver of life of all things. And so uh, what he is doing is making a contrast here. This unknown God, he says there in 1940, I believe that it, uh, or, or that's uh, back to Luke, but in 17... Uh, Let's see. I wrote that down. We're uh, 17, 28, 29. Uh, but, but here Paul says, this unknown God, he, he's not made of stone or wood or any other thing. Why? Because this unknown God is a living rock. He's a living stone. He is a living God. God is who he is. And then you can find in other places, I don't know that I gave this reference to Ken, but, but in Deuteronomy 4 and 28, you read about it all the time in the Old Testament that God would confront these other idols who man had made. I mean, can you imagine man makes them and he makes them out of inanimate objects, stone and wood and etc. and then bows down before them as if they have power. And God said, hey, Hey, these, these idols of rock, they cannot see, they cannot hear, they cannot speak. And then you could go on, if they have no life, what are they able to do to be able to help you? None whatsoever. But the true and the living God, he is a rock, but he's not dead, he's not inanimate, he is breathing and alive and well praise God so he is what we refer to the spirited yes. rock Amen. the spirited rock he's alive yes. he's alive Amen. and so that's what Peter wants to get across he wants them to take it all in of the comfort and the consolation that they can receive of knowing that their God is a rock and stone and he's stable and he's sure and he's safety and he's salvation and all of these other things. But he's not just a rock. He is a living rock. And I, I, I don't have time to spend a lot on this. But Peter goes on and says, you know what? Because he's a living rock, he's able to make us into living or lively stones. We who were dead in our sins, we who were inanimate, if you will, as it relates to God in any of the things of God. But yet as we came to Christ, as we came to this living rock, he in his life was able to pour life into us and not just physical life but spiritual life and not just life but uh, uh, abundant life a life that is more than what we will ever have need of so, so Jesus is the rock he's the stone but he 
is a living stone. Spirited rock. But Peter goes on and says that not only is Christ this spirited stone, but Jesus is a structural stone. Yeah, right. Yes. And in essence, that's what this is all about here. He's the cornerstone. Yes. Hallelujah. Now, back in the day, in the Old Testament, even New Testament, most of the buildings of that time that were of any significant size, they were built out of stone. Their homes were out of clay and out of brick that they would fashion and set out into the sun to harden. Uh, that may be their individual homes, but when it came to larger edifices, that they built them out of rock and stone. And the way that they would do that, which is phenomenal to me, which is the way the temple of the Lord was built, because the Bible said you'll not hear the sound of a hammer. You'll not hear the sound of a chisel on the job site. So what that means is they would go to the quarry and they would dig out the stone. Then they would bring them out of the quarry. They would hew them down there at the quarry to the exact size that they needed to be. And then they would haul them to the building site and put them in place. And so the reference here is that Jesus is this cornerstone in which the builders rejected but, but was foreordained by Almighty God to be the chief cornerstone. Yes. And so he's making reference to two kinds of structural stones here. We hear a lot about the cornerstone, but the cornerstone is exactly that. It is the foundational stone or a part of the foundation that is laid at the very corner of a building. And a cornerstone is that which unites the two walls and makes them one. The cornerstone is also the stone that sets the size of the building, the structure of the building, the, the layout of the building. Everything about the building is is found and seen in that cornerstone. Once again, how big it's going to be, how it's going to face, what it's going to do, all of these things is in the cornerstone. But he also makes reference to the head of the cornerstone. They not only had a cornerstone, but they had a capstone. And a capstone, uh, we're familiar with, if you remember when uh, the arch was built, or you've seen certainly an architectural design of people that build bridges or even cathedral ceilings that they will build them with arches and the arches go in and in and it's that capstone which is the very last one that holds the whole thing securely. But the capstone was also the highest stone of the building. It's the highest stone of the arch, the capstone. It is also related to kind of like the pyramids of the Egyptian it is that last stone that is placed on. It's not, uh, it's not like any other stone. The others were rectangle and built and fashioned and such, but as they came up to the peak, that last stone uh, was, you know, three-sided on, th on the sides and went up to a peak. So it was a thing of beauty. It was that which capped it off. So I don't have time to get into a whole lot here, but, but Peter is saying he's a structural stone. He's the stone that is the chief cornerstone. He is the capstone, the head overall. But you say, how in the world, what, what, what does it mean, the, the cornerstone? Well, one of the basic things of after Pentecost and after the church uh, found its origin and, and its beginning, that remember it started out with the Jews. 
Jews. But then uh, after Pentecost, there were many Greeks and many Gentiles and many others. And Paul was uh, the one that went to uh, the majority of them. And they were getting saved. But yet there was this division, there was this schism that naturally came between Jews and Gentiles and so on and so forth. And so what a beautiful picture that Jesus is the cornerstone, that he is not just the foundation of one nation, Israel, but Jesus is the cornerstone and he unites Jews and he unites Gentiles and he unites whoever they are. He brings them together under the one and says you are built up in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no place for divisions anymore. And even, uh, even, even Paul as he's writing in Galatians to the Galatian church in chapter 3 and 28 and 29 uh, thereabouts that, that Paul says the same thing. He says that in Christ there is no Jew or Greek. In Christ, there's no bond or free. In Christ, there is no male or female. In Christ, there's no rich, there's no poor. In other words, what he's saying, those natural schisms that come and divide people. Jesus is the divine unifier because everybody at the foot of the cross is the same a sinner that needs to be saved by grace your maleness or your femaleness is not going to help you there your money or lack thereof is not going to help you your nationality is not going to help you uh, amen your position in society is not going to help you but all are built up into one spiritual building in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's that cornerstone. But he also sets the standard of the building. He sets the direction of the building. He's the one that says this is how. He's basically the blueprint. He's not just the cornerstone, but he's the blueprint. And says this is how it's going to be built. This is how it must be built. Just as he gave Moses of that blueprint to the tabernacle. Make sure that you make it to the nth degree according to the blueprint. And God has given his church and the building the blueprint which is the word of God. And we would do well if we would heed and be built up on the cornerstone. But not only structurally is he the cornerstone, the foundation, but he's the capstone as well. If I can shift gears in my analogies and my metaphors, because you see, Paul uses so many. Uh, here, Paul talks about, as we've said, but Peter here uh, uses the analogy of architecture. But then in another place in Corinthians, he uses an anatomical analogy of the anatomy of the body. And in Colossians 1 and 18, he says that Christ is the head of the body. Yes. Christ is the head. And seeing that the head is where the brain is, seeing that the head is where the majority of the five senses are, is where we see, where we hear, where we smell, where we taste and can even feel. It's, it's, it's where the beauty of the body is. It's the recognition of when we talk to each other. Or at least you shouldn't stare at somebody's feet when you're talking to them. Uh, you need to look them in the eye. You know, it's the 
face. And so if, if I can just use that scripture of the body, but yet it still applies that he is, is the capstone. He is the one that is the highest. He is the one that brings beauty. He is the one that brings the knowledge. He is the one that is able to guide us and direct us and show us the way. Praise God. And we are the stones. Now, here, when I got to thinking about this, we hear other phrases that, that speaks of the fullness of God. Yes. Of the greatness of God. And Jesus particularly. Because Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and Omega. In the Greek alphabet, I'm the first letter, I'm the last letter. I'm, and then he goes on, not only am I Alpha and Omega, I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. Now what does all that say if God and Jesus, if they are the extremities, the first and the last, then that means that they are everything in between as well. Amen. Amen. But even more so that they are everything in between. As far as a building is concerned, you have the foundation, you have the capstone, but what is in between? That's us. Amen. That's us. Yes. We're the ones yes. that are sandwiched in between. We're the ones that are surrounded by. We're the ones that are protected in and for and with. We're the ones that are supplied. So when he says, I am the foundation but I am the capstone and not only all that that can bring a picture in your mind but you are the lively stones and living stones in between that makes up this spiritual building and uh, this spiritual kingdom of almighty God. So everything around you is the rock. The rock. The rock. The rock. The rock. The rock. And I don't know about you, but in such troubled times as we live today, that gives me a sense of security. Safety. Solidness. Surety. But I've got to move on. <clears throat> Peter said, Jesus is not only this spirited living stone. He's not just this structural stone, the cornerstone and the capstone. But he said he is a stumbling stone. As you read on in the text, he characterizes and contrasts individuals who have come to the foundation of Christ, accepted Him as their Lord and Savior, and are built upon Him. And he contrasts them with those who reject Him. Yes, amen. Now let me just, let me, let me just very quickly talk upon those who have accepted him. You are a living stone as well, but you're a stone that is stable and sure because you're built on the foundation of the rock, not upon the sand. And here in Peter, he said to them, he is precious and they shall not be ashamed. He is precious and they shall not be confounded or ashamed. That's the latter part of verse 6. And if I can just take a moment, he's precious, he's valuable. And we that have come to him, we have found him valuable in every fashion and every way. 
He's valuable as my Savior. He's valuable as my Lord. He is valuable as my protector, as my provider. You know, on and on that you could go. So he is valuable. We have found him that he is our all in all. And it's uh, Paul even uh, related there at Mars Hill. He said that in this God, in him we live and breathe and we have our being. Hallelujah. He not only gives life, but everything that we cherish that goes along with life. He is all of that and more to us. He is precious, precious, valuable. But here's the point, and they shall not be confounded. They shall not be ashamed. Uh, certainly as you step out and begin to walk with God, the world's going to malign you, make fun of you, and say that you're the scum of the earth because you are a believer in Christ and so on. But the point of the matter is they can say whatever they say. We're going to hold our head up high. We're not going to be ashamed. We're not going to be silenced. And we're not going to be cowering in a corner somewhere. But we are going to stand and not be ashamed. But, but the word confounded also, it means that it shall not flee. They shall not flee. They shall not run. And so if you're built up on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ and as Jesus said, and you're not built upon the sand when the storms come, when the rains come, when all that hell unleashes that it can against you, you're going to be able to stand. You're not going to run. You're going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a lot more that, that's in that passage but, but here's where I really want to get to. He said for those that are disobedient to the word he becomes a stumbling stone to them. Jesus is not the cause of their stumbling. He's simply the object of their stumbling. He doesn't want anyone to stumble and fall. But yet he is the object of many stumbling. Why? Because of their unbelief. That's true. They just can't get over the fact. They just can't get over that he's God. That there is absolute truth, which is in the word of God. They, they, they just can't. And so in their, their anti-God and anti-Christ, anti-word, anti-truth, in all of this rhetoric, it's causing them to stumble and stumble and stumble and stumble. And folks, that's where I see our nation right now. At one time, we stood firmly on the Judeo-Christian uh, principles of God's Word. And that we were all made in the image of God. And the rights that we receive does not come from government, but it comes from Almighty God. And so we stood solid and true, but then the new man's ideologies and philosophies and, and in this culture in which we live, there's no place for God. And because of that, we have now begun to stumble. We're not standing strong and sure, but we're stumbling everywhere. And you know what? If we continue to stumble, the ultimate is we're eventually going to fall. Yes. And you know how it is to stumble on something, especially if you're you're really going at a at a quick gate. And I mean you stumble and you know, you're waving your arms, you're leaning forward, you're flailing your arms, you're trying to get your balance. That's how I see America right now. She's not standing strong. She's not true, but she's flailing her 
arms trying to gain balance but never ever will do so without the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he is the stumbling stone. If you will not accept him as true and savior and allow disbelief and doubt and all of that uh, cloud your mind and dismiss him uh, then you're going to stumble. But the Bible last but not least speaks of Christ as the striking stone. In our text in the last verse, in verse 8, in a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Appointed for what? It's appointed unto man wants to die, and then the judgment. So if you continue to stumble, you will eventually fall. And if you fall and remain in that fallen state, then Jesus becomes the not just that stumbling stone, but he becomes that striking stone. Yes. Yes. We saw it in the book of Daniel of all these great kingdoms. Babylonian, the Medes, the Persians, the Grecians, the Romans. But Daniel said there was this little rock that came out of the mountain. Yes. And it struck and it crushed. Yes. Right. The last part of the legs and feet of the renewed Roman Empire. Yes. I'm going to close with this of the striking stone in Matthew chapter 21. Jesus makes reference of himself. In Matthew chapter 21 and verses 42, And Jesus said unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall not be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken but on whomsoever it shall fall it shall grind him yes. to powder yes. yes if individuals are stumbling now's the time to get right with God yes. because this stumbling stone will become a striking stone yes. and what he's saying appointed unto as Peter says they're appointed unto judgment I know the world laughs and as Peter said in another place that we've heard from the very beginning that, that the Lord's coming and nothing has ever changed but let me tell you folks payday is is coming someday. Yes, it is. Amen. Judgment is coming someday. And this stone that you can build yourself up and have life and abundant life and all of the good things that come with it. No. But I'm telling you, if you reject him, you will not only stumble for a large period of your life or as long as you disobey, but there will come a point where you will eventually fall as you try to do it on your own yes. and according to your own wisdom. Jesus is the rock. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's the Jesus. He's that spirited stone. He's alive. Amen. He's alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's that structural stone that we can build our lives, our homes, our jobs, our professions, our futures. We can build solidly upon Him and not be ashamed or not confounded. But we got to keep moving forward. 
And I can't help but see those that are stumbling. Just as you know when somebody is stumbling and recognize it, you can see it in the spiritual sense as well. You can see the struggle. You can see it upon the countenance of their face. You can see it in every part of their lives. And so church, that's where we are there as they are ready to fall. You know that if, 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 if you're stumbling like that, if you have something to lean against or somebody's there to help catch you, ah, praise God. That's what God has called every one of us to do. There's a lot stumbling around us. But let's reach out. We're on solid ground. And let's take hold of them and come beside them and strengthen them and let them know that there is solid ground in which you can build your life upon. And that truly is the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me if you would. We're going to gather around the altar here in just a moment. But I would like for every head to be bowed and every eye to be Refuse to live one day as before. I wonder if every one of us, I and I believe that we have, without Jesus. But I just want to make sure so that we have all built Jesus our life upon that precious cornerstone, that precious foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to know that if you're unsure about that and you have not done that, that you can do that right here this morning. It's very easy. We just call out upon the Lord. We believe that God has raised Jesus from the dead. And we believe that He is our Savior. And we ask Him to forgive us. And uh, the Bible says if we ask, He will forgive us of all of our sins and all of our iniquities. So, hallelujah. Everyone that will, would you meet me here at this altar? Everyone.